Hey guys, what's up? Justin here. And so, oh, we are so glad that you've joined us today to dig deeper into the Word of God. And so we know things are a little real bizarre right now, and we just miss you guys so much. We miss getting to hang out and have those fun Sunday evenings. But we have a few big announcements that we have for you. And the first thing is this, is that we are still doing groups. We are still doing life groups, but it's not gonna necessarily be in the traditional sense of what we were doing before. So we're gonna do life groups online. So here's what we plan on doing with that. We need you to go home or right now download Zoom on your mobile device or on your computer. And so after you do that, your leader's gonna start contacting you. And if they don't contact you before Sunday, please reach out to them or reach out to somebody else in your group and figure out what you guys are doing. And it's just a really cool thing and we believe in these. We believe in life groups and so we really want you to be a part of that. And so here's gonna be the times. If you're a middle schooler, your life groups are gonna be at four o'clock. And so your leaders are gonna hang out with you. They're gonna talk about the message, talk about life. And high schoolers, same thing, it's gonna be at six o'clock. Your groups are meeting at six. And so we really wanna encourage you once again, we believe in groups, we want you to be a part of it. And so hang out with us starting this Sunday. Uh, and the next thing is we're doing a Bible reading plan as a group. And so if you don't have the Bible app downloaded on your phone or tablet or whatever, please download it, make a profile, and then add Winston, myself, or your life group leader, or whoever, and we will make sure that you get put on the plan that we are doing as a youth group. It's a really, really cool app, and we really are excited about using it during this time to stay connected as a group. And the last thing I want to announce is we are still taking um, CIY signups. And so if you're a middle schooler and you want to go to Mix, or you're a high school and you want to go to Move, we encourage you to still sign up and come hang out with us at CIY this summer. All right, guys, without further ado, once again, we miss you guys. We love you. Here's Winston with this week's message. See you later. Fear. Yes, we all have fear. Some of us are afraid of spiders. Some of us are afraid of snakes. Some of us are afraid of the dark. Other of us are afraid that there's no March Madness or NBA or baseball opening day. In all seriousness, we all struggle when things don't go according to plan. Maybe it's a rejection letter from the college we wanted to go to or when mom and dad are fighting and you hear the word divorce spoken. Or maybe you're wondering about your worth because that girl is just not interested in you or that guy, he cheated on you. All of this incites fear. So the question is, what do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a storm and you just can't see an end in sight? What do you do when you are paralyzed fear. I'm a, I remember being with my cousins in Mississippi one summer. We were sharing scary stories under the moonlight and my cousin shared the story of a local legend called Wild Bill Sullivan. History said he would wander around the woods at night looking, haunting, uh, abducting people, never to be seen again. And so he said that uh, his home is still standing. How about we go there? So we all hopped in the car and drove to this old, broken down cabin in the woods with signs all over it saying, do not trespass. And when we walked up to that home, um, started walking on the deck, I was already thinking about my escape route and who I'd be using as a human shield when fleeing for my life. But when we opened that door, it was dusty, it was dark, it was broken down. There was just a rocking chair sitting in the middle of a room. I was terrified. You know, fear is such an interesting thing. You know, the definition of it is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous. And that something that's dangerous is going to cause us pain or is a threat. So let me ask you, 
What do you do when confronted with something dangerous? Where do you turn to when the threat stares you in the face? I realize that most of you turn to friends or family for help. My guess would be sometimes they help with good advice and sometimes not so much. Sometimes people are there to help and sometimes there's nothing they can do. Has anyone ever felt alone during a difficult time? I hope that you will know that no matter what is causing you distress or pain or sleepless nights, that no matter how big or how hopeless the situation may be, there is always hope. And we see in God's word that he is the hope. In Psalm 46, we see that hope. What we see is this guy by the name of David, he's having some crazy issues going on in the kingdom. Let alone this guy, he fell into sin. He had nations from all around attacking him. He had the Philistines uh, from the west, and he had the Amorites and the Edomites and the Jebusites. And, and then he had his sons even try to overthrow him. And in the midst of it, he was crying out to God. And, and we see in Psalm 46, 1 through 3, he says this. He says, God, you are my refuge and you are my strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains should slip into the sea. Though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains quake at its swelling. What we see here is he says that, that you, are, you are first my refuge. And when I think of that word, it's, it's a beautiful word to me because it's, it's this image of, of a running and a fleeing. We would think almost as a retreat. Like you're fleeing for your life. But what it's saying is that you're actually fleeing to something that will protect you. You're running to something that will, that will be a fortress to you. I remember a story uh, just recently actually with my daughter Charlie and, and she's only nine months old and she's just started crawling around and, and, and she crawls and, and stands up on things and uh, it, was, it was recent that we were just cleaning our house to get ready for some guests that were coming over. And so I went to go get my vacuum and I turned it on and I started vacuuming and my wife started busting out laughing. And so I stopped it. I turned it off and said, hey, what's going on? And she said, when you turn on the vacuum, Charlie moved faster than she ever had. She turned and started scurrying away for her life. And so us being the great parents that we are, we decided to do it again because I wanted to see it. And so I turned on the vacuum and she started to scurry, but this time she started to go towards me. And when she got up to me, I picked her up in my arms and I held her and she immediately stopped crying. And she turned and she looked at the vacuum and then and then I and then I bent over and I let her touch the vacuum and, and see that it's it's not gonna harm her. But she didn't even get scared for a moment once she was in my arms. And so when we see this word in, in Psalm 46 1, it says, He is first our refuge. We run into his arms. Then we see second that he is actually our strength. When we're running to something, it's something of strength and it shows us that, that we have someone who's going to fight for us. We don't have the strength. We don't have the power. We don't have the ability. He does. We see in, in the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians, when we are weak, that is when we are actually strong. It's because, it's because God is the one in our corner. He's the one that is fighting for us. And so when I read this, it, it, it challenges me. Because if he's our refuge, he's our strength. Everything, everything falls away in his presence, whether the mountains or the sea, it, it's nothing. And it begs these questions. What is going on in your life right now that is consuming you with fear? What is it right now in your life that is taking you away from being used by God? What is it that's making you worry? What is it that's making you nervous? What is it that is scaring you? 
Are you willing to be still and know that he is God? Are you able to do that? Psalm 46, four through nine goes on to say this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the most high. God is in the midst of her and she will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. I love this part. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. You know, when I, when I hear that, I think about, again, the strength and the power of God. This is all to build up who God is. You know, if, if I'm gonna talk about someone and I'm gonna build them up, I'm gonna share some characteristics about them. If I'm going to have a debate about who's the best basketball player in the world, is it is it Michael Jordan, is it Kobe Bryant, is it LeBron James, I'm gonna share some things about them. I'm gonna say, you know, Michael Jordan, he won six championships and he was a six time MVP in the finals. You know, LeBron, he, he's one of the leading players in assists and rebounds and points. You know, Kobe Bryant, he dominated in the playoffs. I'm gonna share characteristics of who they are to build my point. And so what we see here is a building up of who God is. And so I think about that. Is his power greater than earthquakes? Yes. Is, is his power greater than the ocean? Absolutely, no question. You know, is his power greater than our anxieties? Yes. Is his power greater than our depression? Is, is his power greater than our relationship status, or di a disease or virus we're fighting, COVID-19? Absolutely. And so when we hear that, it goes into this final verse. Well, the last two verses, it said, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am the Father. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. This image of stillness. And I know this is a hard topic in our in our world because we're we're a nation that that breathes. How do I say this? We honor people who are busy. It gives them worth that they have no time. Oh, I got this going on. I got this appointment. I got this time hanging out with my friends. I have uh, no time available. Well, in, in God's economy, there is great power in stillness, in silence, in practicing the presence, in stopping for a moment and saying, God, you are here. Even in this moment, God is here. In your home, God is there. In the midst of famine, of pain, of cancer, of anxiety, God is here and he will be honored, and he will be exalted. So I want you to think with me for a second. What is the biggest problem you are facing right now? What is it? What is the thing right now? You fill in that blank. What is it that is conquering you and making you live in fear? The Psalm ends with an incredible visual. It says in the 11th verse, the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel 
is our fortress. Can you picture God standing in front of an army of angels? His voice can calm the seas. His voice commands the armies of heaven. He is our comfort and our fortress. He is our help in times of trouble. He is our refuge. He is our strength. I love the words of Rick Warren. He says, fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God intends for you to be. You must move against it with the weapons of faith and love. So how do you fight fear? You have to meet fear with your faith. Meet it with faith. Fight against it with love. And you will overcome. God, I pray that we lean into your word. That we never forget that you are the God of angel armies. That you are our fortress. I pray that we meet our fear with faith. That we don't have this self-imposed prison that keeps us from being what you have intended us to be. Let us fight, Father. Let us run into your arms for protection. Let us remember your truth, that you are always ready to help in times of trouble. And even with the world of the coronavirus, the world of being stuck in our homes, the world of not being able to be with friends, and maybe getting behind in school, or just feeling insecure and not good about ourselves. Let's stand against that fear. Let's stand against that enemy in our life, remembering that you are with us because you, you have overcome the world. We love you and we pray this all in your name. Amen. Hey guys, um, and so once again, we're just so thankful that you're hanging out with us and watching ESM online, and we wanted to do communion together. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to set it up yet, go get that bread and juice, and, and we'll just take communion together as a youth group like we've always done on Sunday morning. So no matter when you're watching this, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, Tuesday, whatever, I want to encourage you to take time to remember the sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us. Something I always think about when, with communion and with this time is that Jesus predicted his death. Jesus knew that he was going to die. And he says it here, and I want to read this verse to you. It's in Mark 8, 31. It says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus knew. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He knew the details. And yet, he loved not just the people in the present, but the people, you, me, people he didn't even know, people who weren't born yet. He died for us. And so as we take this communion and, and we share in this moment together, I want to encourage you to think about what that sacrifice meant, what it meant for you. Jesus died so you could experience eternity with him.